Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back. Good to see you. Or not see you, because technically I'm talking to a screen, but that's okay. Um, welcome, 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 welcome. As you can see, I am not in my usual environment. I am at home in California visiting my family uh, for a little while, so I'm in my childhood bedroom right now, which is a little weird. Um, you know, I've changed a lot, my family changed a lot, things have changed a lot. It's my first time home since Shadow Illusions was released. I was home, actually, the week that it was released, because it came out earlier than expected. Amazon released the title, but, you know, four days early, but that's a whole other story. So I was actually home when I got the email that it was released early, but I haven't been home since, like, things started moving and people started reading it and hearing the feedback and all this stuff. So a lot has changed, but then I come into my room and everything's the same. My books are all in the same place. My photos from high school are still in the same place. My piano is still over there. All of my artwork from high school is still hanging on the wall, which is, you know, funny and weird because time kind of stood still here. So it's just, you know, fun to be back and I figured that it would be a nice place to do a little bit of reading. So I wanted to tell you guys about the copy that I have with me today. It looks like a regular copy of Shadow Illusions. Technically it is a regular copy of Shadow Illusions. The only difference is that it's signed. I just finished signing it actually a moment ago. And I'm shipping it tomorrow to England. I'm sending it to a YouTube blogger that I follow. Her name is Carrie Hope Fletcher. Uh, I've been following her channel for about two years, a little bit less. Um, she's really cool and really fun, and she gives really fun advice, just really good, solid advice about life, and she reminds me a little bit of myself. We both have the same crazy curly hair, although she's blonde and I'm a brunette, and, you know, she's very spontaneous, and she likes to take action, she likes to take risks, she's very ambitious, and I see a lot of myself in her, and I just like her spontaneous, fun energy, and she likes to receive mail from her YouTube followers, so I thought it would be kind of, you know, cool to send a copy of Shadow Illusions to someone that I kind of view as a celebrity. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I hope she reads it. I hope she likes it. She's really busy now. She's doing um, London's Broadway rendition of Les Mis right now, so she's like super busy and not, you know, whatever, but I figured it would be cool for her to have a copy and maybe she'll watch this video. I, you know, kind of doubt it, but whatever. So, yeah, I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about that. So, today we're going to be reading from Chapter 5, um, Sarah Grigg. This is the fourth, the fifth character, technically, that we're being introduced to. So, so far we've met Ella, Marco, the unnamed voice, and Danny. Um, Ella, Marco, and Danny, um, we got to know a little bit about them, their families, where they come from, who they are. Um, not so much about the murder yet. So, this is really the first time we're going to hear about the murder. So, today we're going to read, starting on page 42 you know, get get to know Sarah Grigg. All right, here we go. Let's straight my glasses here. Okay, here we go. Chapter 5. Sarah Grigg, Tuesday, July 17th, 2007. If you're looking for the truth, you've come to the wrong place. I'm currently running away from the truth, so you will not find it here. Honesty? Honesty is a lie. Self-sacrifice? Honesty's neighbor, whose traits are almost parallel. Love? Friendship? Compassion? Tranquility? Forget it. You're never going to find any of those things, so stop looking. A smile broke out on my face as I read the words I'd written. They wouldn't sell to the crowd, but they'd work wonders for me. I tapped the tip of my pen against the de desk, which reverberated beneath me. The apartment I had rented out for the summer came complete, with the wonderful old southern pieces, one more eager to fall apart than the next. I looked around at the one bedroom, half a kitchen, and a quarter of a bathroom. You'd have thought that a person like me would take the extra precaution of looking at the establishment before going with as far as calling it home. Better yet, why not get a hotel room at a fancy place in New Orleans? No maintenance, no broken furniture, no noisy neighbors. Yet, I had chosen to come here because of the tranquility, the calm, the simplicity. Getting away from Detroit had been absolutely essential, from home absolutely necessary, and this apartment building in this town in the middle of nowhere had just reeked of escape, so I grasped the opportunity with both hands. I was writing a speech for my next seminar. Along with the other self-help groups I have led, I, run, I have run programs for youth. I have spoken around the country, giving lectures about healthy relationships and helping yourself to help others. Of course, I have my clinic. I was writing a speech for a non-existent seminar. As far as my patients were concerned, I had fallen off the face of the earth, been swallowed alive by the ground. My followers had stopped following. My large audience had fallen to pieces. There was no seminar because I had blown up my life in front of an audience of 1,500 people at the most important public event of my career, only a day before I made my drastic move here. Flashbacks of that day swell in my brain, and as hard as I try to push them out, they always manage to weasel themselves back in with double the immensity. 
the crowded room, all those people churning their anticipation into their chairs, their clothes, their stances, they literally smelled of anxiety. These people had come from far and wide to hear me speak, to absorb my ideas and strategies on how not to victimize themselves in a relationship. I had spent six months preparing for that day. I had written 16 different speeches, and I hadn't even decided on which one to use until the morning of. I was ready to go out there with a large smile on my face and educate those people. My goal was to show them that by victimizing themselves, they were hurting not only themselves, but everyone around them. In doing so, I was pretty sure that I would educate the poor, lost person trapped inside of me, the one who made the same mistake that I was about to enlighten them about. I felt empowered. Then my phone rang. If you could only hear my sister's voice on the other end of the line, you'd understand what happened to me at that moment. The color rushed out of my face when she, amid sobs and moans, told me that her husband of six years was leaving her for her best friend. Fifteen minutes before showtime, there I was, taking the pain from my sister, sponging up her emotions, sobs, screams, and putting them into my own body. Just like that, I became the victim. I was no, it was no longer my sister's struggle. Suddenly, I was a hurt, abused, lost soul. I am no stranger to the act of victimization. In fact, I believe that all people allow this syndrome to take the lead in their lives without realizing it or trying to stop it. You hear of, another's per you hear of another person's problems, automatically feel the need to solve, their pain, to solve their pain, so you make it your own. After a while, you are constantly absorbing other people's problems into your body, your, your bloodstream, and your soul. So instead of going out to face a crowd of empty people and empower them, when they called me up to the podium, I stood there motionless, helpless before an audience just like me and whom I felt I could not help, since in a sense, all I would be would do there would, would be uh, all I would all I would do there up there would, would be to fruitlessly attempt to take their pain away from them. I I appeared on stage to the sound of vivacious applause, the smiles and the tears of people who needed guidance. I had none to give them because my mind was racing. How could I help my sister? I'm a sorry excuse for a therapist. Aren't people like me supposed to be the ones with the fewest problems? My life proves otherwise. I don't mean to sound rude or narcissistic, but I probably do. Give me any problem that you have in your life, marital, work-related, emotional, and I will solve them for you. That has always been my biggest problem. I take on my cases as if I were taking on my own issues. When I was in school, my teachers told me repeatedly that once I opened my own clinic, I could not allow myself to attach myself wholly to the problems that my patients would present because it would only become harder for me to work. Maybe that explains why I ran from a huge, successful career, an empire, a crowning glory, three book deals, and a lecture tour meant to run through six European countries. I ran away from all of that and settled here. I had been living in Roland for two, week, two and a half weeks when I met Sam Knightley for the first time. We were next-door neighbors. It was a temporary arrangement while I helped my sister piece her life back together. I had come with the intention of being by her side every waking hour, holding her hand through every step of the day. After two days, however, being around her had proved to be too much. Since I was dealing with my own third divorce, and she too was in a similar situation, it became like watching myself in a different incarnation. I couldn't handle it, so I found that small apartment just big enough for me and my thoughts. If I'd considered my own emo emotional baggage in the calculation, I would have needed to rent a much, much bigger place. To be honest, I don't know why I didn't think of introducing myself to him sooner. I guess it was just I was so used to hiding from strangers in fear that they might leap at me for advice. At the same time, Sam and I were the only ones occupying the six-unit building on Main and Fifth, aside from the manager, who lived in the office. Sam and I met the night of his murder. In the 30 seconds that it took for us to become acquainted with one another, I felt a very strong connection to him, a bond. He radiated light. He was absolutely the most genuine of men. How strange that I had been able to pick up a sense of comfort from him in only a half a minute we spent talking. I was leaving the complex at around 8.45 p.m. It was mid-July, the heat was crisping the air, and I, needing a break from my silent apartment, had decided to catch a movie at the theater down the street. I was instantly assaulted by the stench of the deep summer heat when I left my apartment. Sam was standing in the doorway of his apartment, directly across from me, with the door wide open, ex exposing his interior to the world as if he had nothing to hide. He was smoking, taking long drags from his cigarette before exhaling briskly. I pulled the door shut, waved as if to dispel the smoke. Nasty habit, I said. Thanks for your concern, sweetie, but I'm just fine as I am, he answered in a deep British accent. Yeah, another thing, guys, I still can't get the accents down, you know. Okay. I'm not kidding, kid, I joked, fiddling in my purse for my keys to my apartment. You're too young to sell your soul to the devil. Too late, he retorted. 
Anyway, you're probably a drug addict, he added coolly. Excuse me? I asked, appalled, and glared at him. What would make you say that? Oh, nothing, but it got your attention. I hate it if people don't look at me in the eye when you speak. A large, cheesy smile spread across his face, exposing his yellowing teeth. Name's Sam, he said, stretching his hand out across the hallway to shake mine. Our worlds collided when I took it. That simple gesture bonded us, as it was as if I was looking into his soul. All right, that's where we're going to stop today. We're on page 45 at the bottom. So uh, in next week's video, we're uh, finally going to get to see what really happened to Sam the night that he was murdered. So you guys, you know, if you have your copies, read ahead 46, 47, 48, find out what actually happens. Um, in the meantime, if you don't already own a copy of Shadow Illusions and would like to, um, the links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and my website are below. Um, the link to my website is for signed copies, so you guys, you know, that's kind of cool. Alright guys, have a lovely day, and I'll see you soon.